Okay, do you want to pick it up from there? Yeah, let's click. I'm going <clears> to... <throat> Uh, yeah, my name's Kate Twist, and I'd, I'd like to thank SAR and Mokna for hosting this event, as well as everyone that's uh, here in attendance. Thank you all for, for supporting this. Um, I work in, as a, I have an individual art practice and a, uh, a collective art practice with uh, Post Commodity. Um, both practices have a lot of overlap. I tend to use my individual art practice to focus on more personal things, more uh, tribally specific narratives, more lived experiences, um, post-commodity. Um, we alternate around the group in terms of that and uh, in terms of individual uh, interests and things like that based on ideas. But um, with both art practices, I think there's something, um, and this is going back to the original idea of this um, panel, um, you know, I, I always have a formula that I think about, and it's not a, like a color wheel or anything, but um, it's a diagram, and I go over this with my students when I teach classes. I had the good fortune of teaching at Arizona State University. Um, but when considering issues of content, which I call issues of narrative, um, uh, or issues of materiality, um, something that's really important for myself is finding balance. You know, half the time when I'm working on a piece, um, I tend to be kind of an aggressive person uh, theoretically, so it's always uh, kind of finding balance. Um, you know, balance between the, the conceptual framework, you know, the aesthetic framework, you know, the medium that I'm working in, you know, the, uh, the technique, and course the intentionality um, uh, that I have in, in engaging the, the development of the work um, I would never I never attempt to put one o over the other I, I think material is is can be just as much linked with um, content or advancing a conceptual idea or um, a narrative as uh, a word or a color or um, a uh, phrase that actors or actresses might say in a in a video. Um, there, I think the tough part is finding that appropriate balance. And I think the older you get as an artist and the more experience you have uh, working, um, I think the easier it is to to find that balance. And I don't think there's a particular trick for doing so, um, but uh, it's it's always the the primary driver. Um, Ideas are drivers for me. I started out as a writer, as a, a, a poet. I'm a policy analyst. Um, so I'm really used to making ideas both metaphor and, and concrete um, and pliable and replicable. So I, I bring that uh, to my art. And it's usually the idea that determines the medium that I'm working in, I would say, more, more so than anything else. I have no obedience to a medium, and I'm, I'm just not particularly driven by you know one thing or another. So it's it's I just let the idea uh, take control. So I'm going to click through a couple works, and then I'll focus on um, two works in particular. Um, uh, but let let's click through. This is uh, just some titles. This is a an image um, from, uh, it's, uh, for you shall pass through the water of another, um, that Laura talked about. Um, one thing about that piece is it's amazing, um, how easy it is to reference, um, the art of antiquity, uh, in video. Uh, you find people just gather and create these amazing types of images, um, living installations. And I, I try to capture that occasionally as a tongue in cheek to help uh, strengthen, you know, the work and the balance. So there are some referential uh, qualities there, uh, for sure. Um, but next slide, please. Um, again, here's this was uh, shown here, um, a part of the vision uh, programming um, that was uh, a part of II, and and um, I think uh, the book uh, manifestations. Um, but. Uh, this was a piece I did for that. Uh, for instance, uh, the land beneath your feet, and it's a dialogue among two real estate, a uh, real estate agent and a broker. 
And they're talking about something really sacred, which is land, since a place, but they never mention um, any words that are remotely sacred. It's purely a commodity, and it's a commodity being positioned in the market so their client can um, take uh, the best advantage of, of the situation. So I found that as a really interesting metaphor to work with for a larger discourse about um, land use issues, which I often um, refer to. That's my go-to move, you might say. Um, next slide. Um, this piece I'll talk a little bit longer. Um, uh, I think a lot of, of art is myth-making. Um, that goes to the content side. I mean, a lot of what we do as artists is help rationalize our contemporary shared relationship and the metaphors we create are often guideposts uh, for uh, history. Um, not to say that the work that I create is, will be one of those guide, part, guide marks, but work can be that. And, and I think artists strive to do that. And there's a fundamental question I'm posing as a Cherokee person, you know, um, buzzards or Condors are a really important part of our, our stories, our history. Their, their uh, wings uh, created the, uh, the mountains and valleys of our homelands in, in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee. So um, I'm stuck with this story, uh, a Cherokee story, Hunter and Buzzard. And for me, it's a great uh, story of scarcity and what people are willing to do to overcome scarcities. And um, the buzzer is a trickster, is a trickster character in that, in that story. Um, and uh, it's something that I really employ. So what I wanted to do was get involved in gauging this, this story, this myth, and try to humanize it. So we have these portraits of, uh, of California condors. And this um, question is, what happens when your spiritual mediators become extinct, you know, as a people, as a tribe, as a culture, as a civilization? Um, for Cherokees, a buzzard is an important mediator. Um, the California condor, in particular, is what our great buzzard, Suli, was modeled after. Um, before uh, settlement or colonization or whatever term you want to use, um, the California condor ranged from Vancouver uh, down the coast through the south all the way up the east coast into the Carolinas. Now they are federally managed. You'll never find a condor without a number on it, without a tag, without a radio transmitter. You'll never find a condor that wasn't raised by a human hand, a puppet, fed. You won't find a condor that exists that's sustainable, that can provide for itself. They eat where they're fed. You know, that's the thing. And th there's a feedback loop, a logical, conceptual feedback loop that I, I like to comment on, is um, the same conceptual framework that creates the scarcities that necessitates something like a preservation program uh, is the same conceptual framework, the same worldview that is running that uh, program, the savior program. And what happens is that Western scientific worldview, they like to remake things in their own image. It's out, it comes out of the scripture. And so that's something that they try to make with California condors. So I wanted to refer to that and try to humanize them as much as possible. So you get the portraits. And there's another slide you'll see, another detail of the installation environment. Uh, give you a sense of scale. Uh, the images are nine feet high um, and uh, seven channel video with, with uh, five channel uh, generative sound uh, piece. And next uh, image, and here you'll see the numbers associated with them, their tags. And you'll be able to see some of their radio trans transceivers. Um, so that's a type of work very, very closely linked to my Cherokee um, ways, you know. But I think it's, a, it's a, maybe a 21st century spin on an old story, and th these are the characters from that story. And uh, I, I think it's a, it's a cautionary tale in some ways, but it's a metaphor that I really like to share with, with, with people, Cherokee people and, and non-Cherokee Cherokee people alike. Uh, next, uh, I'll go through a couple slides real quick. Um, again, dealing with um, materiality, narrative, 
you look at this, you can't see anything. It looks like a, min a, a cold, austere, minimalist sculpture. Um, but uh, underneath the earth, um, there's uh, pee posh songs um, being uh, recorded by the uh, microphone that's dangling above the earth. Um, and that goes through the, a network of speakers and processing and gets uh, pushed around the room and spatialized. Included in that is the sound of the, the block of concrete that's put on the, the plinth there. The resonant frequency is being recorded from that block of concrete and cycled in with the sound, creating a feedback loop. But since a microphone is there, it enables audience members to interrupt that feedback loop through self-determination. You make an action, you say something, you clap your hands. For a moment, you interrupt the feedback loop. You can shift the discourse. This is something we all have the capacity to do. But you walk into the room, and in terms of materiality, it looks like a post minimalist sculpture. Next slide, please. Uh, this was uh, uh, a piece, um, My Blood is in the Water, uh, that we did here when um, uh, Ryan Rice curated Post Commodity uh, in an exhibition here. It's a really, really great experience for Post Commodity to do work in, an, like, um, at Mokna at IAI uh, Museum because it is like a spiritual home place for contemporary Indian art and expression and ideas. It's a safe place. And um, Ryan welcomed us into that space, it encouraged us to really swing for the fences, and um, he was very generous with us and commissioned three pieces um, that we, we produced. This is one of them, again, in terms of materiality, you can't get any more traditional than those um, materials. However, there's blood dripping out of that onto a drum every 15 seconds and amplified, and you have this huge explosion you know, that happens with the 500 watt bass amp that's playing that blood dripping on, the, on, the, um, on that Pueblo drum. As well as we fed the, the meat from that deer to the people at our art talk, to the uh, audience, you know, as, uh, um, as a little bit of a social engagement piece. Um, but uh, you have one of the lifelong spiritual mediators of this landscape just um, brought into our narrative and into the and just acknowledging the narrative of the indigenous people and non-indigenous people of this landscape we're all codependent upon that spiritual mediator um, next slide please and that's a, another one a pool pump with a bunch of pvc pipe um, playing two uh, pool pumps as, and using them tuning them with the different pipe links to different pitches or uh, third note so we could create a you know harmonic uh, oscillation or difference tone, um, and dealing with water as material, um, so issues of sustainability come to mind. Um, and again, the issue of the feedback loop, the water cycling through references that earlier uh, Western scientific worldview feedback loop. Um, and then the final one, I think, this is a piece we're working on right now. Again, materiality. Um, there's nothing really significant here that signifies Indian culture, um, but it is returning to the land. And in May 2015, uh, with the generosity of, of Creative Capital uh, Foundation, the Native Arts and Culture Foundation, um, Art Matters, and um, the uh, Joan Mitchell Foundation, um, we we're able to uh, pull together about uh, $140,000 to do this uh, piece independently outside of an institution. So it's kind of a throwback piece, you know, going back to the days of, uh, you know, expanded function artists when people were trying, expanded field artists, expanded practice artists, people moving outside of the studio, moving outside of institutions, going back to the land. We we're trying to reference that spirit. Uh, but we're also trying to shift discourse around border issues and trans-border experience. Um, you know, li after living and uh, growing up in California, living in Arizona, um, always living in a border region, um, you'll find that the brown people that come across the border uh, for work, uh, much like they have for thousands of years, our trade routes connect. We're connected by language, we're connected by iconography, we're connected by ceremony. Mysteriously, they're dismissed as Mexican or Guatemalan or Salvadorian. Their indigenous backgrounds are never acknowledged nor named, 
you know, nor brought into the discourse. The sustainability of their communities within the backdrop of NAFTA, it's indigenous communities, never really discussed out loud. It's always Mexicans, it's always Guatemalan, Salvadorians. So we would like to shift that discourse and inject a little bit of indigenous respect for the indigenous people who cross our borders every day for work, for survivance, just as if we have for thousands of years before it was militarized. So we're gonna do a four mile installation, two miles on the US side, two miles on the Mexico side, it's intersecting the border uh, about 10 miles uh, east of Douglas, Arizona. And so there's a port of entry there. So people who go to visit the peace will have easy access. On the Mexico side, there's a highway, Highway 2. On the US side, there's a, uh, a gravel road that's very safe, very, well, just got graded in great shape. So easy travel. Um, it'll be on an old uh, land uh, uh, grant, like the old Spanish land grant. Um, and it's the one of the original land grants of that area. Uh, it just happens to be uh, used by uh, white ranchers uh, that have been ranching there since the 1880s on the U.S. side. And the same uh, Mexican family that received the grant is still ranching that property uh, on the south side of the border. So it's a way of bringing that piece of land together, but a way of also looking at all of the tribes that are along the border uh, in Arizona, at least, um, you have the Tona Otham, uh, you, you have uh, Pasco Yaqui, um, you have um, uh, Fort, uh, oh, uh, Fort, um, is it not Fort Mojave? Um, Huachuca, no. Um, there's a couple other tribes. They're both divided by the reservation by the, their reservations are divided by uh, the US-Mexico border. So um, we're using that metaphor as um, reconnecting and acknowledging, you know, the land underneath the, uh, the border. Um, so that, that's what we're working on. I, I think, um, and the material is, a, is, is modeled after a scare eye balloon. Um, the Scare Eye Balloon is a consumer bird repellent product. It just so happens to, right off the shelf, contain like Indian medicine colors, yellow, red, white, black. Um, and it uses a graphic uh, icon, which is a really critical, it's like an eye type of graphic, which is used by Southeast Indian, uh, Southeast uh, American Indians uh, through the, the Southwest, all the way down into Central America, the same iconography. So that came right off the shelf. Um, of course, uh, when it comes off the shelf, it's embedded with consumer obsolescence. And we really want to riff on that a little bit as well. But thank you. Well, as you can see, um, these two artists aren't being contained by what other people think about their art, and they are definitely shifting the discourse. But to open the conversation, I would like to return to you, Laura, and uh, talk about what it is, because um, I think that interpreting art, writing critically about art, is a way of also reaching an audience. Um, both of you are finding an audience directly, but uh, Ryan Rice and I have had this conversation um, at the George O'Keefe Museum on a daily basis. I'm asked where the flowers are. And she didn't paint very many flowers, but people still come for those. And Ryan, one day I was complaining about we had no flowers up, so it was a really hard summer. Ryan says, the same thing happens at Mokna. And I said, what, they're asking you for flowers? And he said, no, they ask, where are the Indians? So this idea of trying to reach an audience, I can, um, just simply put up uh, a new kind of art, but if I don't engage the audience in that, I'm not doing my work as a curator. So writing critically and teaching art history is part of that. How to find an audience and help guide them with questions and commentary. So can you talk about the new criticism and what part it plays, Laura? I was really lucky to, I think, come along at the, the moment I did and to, uh, to have a background as a practicing artist as well. And I bring everything, um, comes from the point of being a person who makes things. 
And, um, but as a person who makes things, I don't always feel that I have the most freedom to really say what my work means, at least not diplomatically. Um, I think a role for criticism is really important, particularly um, in moments and situations where artists might not have the, um, the political or diplomatic means by which to talk about what, uh, what the issues are that are in their work. Um, because sometimes it's hard messages to hear. Um, for example, uh, Kay's piece about the river rafting, inner tubing. Um, he's taking something that's uh, perceived as innocent and fun and making it a much deeper weight. And that's not something that's um, probably very popular as, a, as just to do a straight out criticism of something that is an enjoyable pastime, so to speak. But having people talk about the work, and he does a great job of talking about it himself, although it does end up couched in language that's very um, difficult, and it conceals some of what the piece does. And there's a reason for that, because I think, and here's, this is, this is a sensitive thing, but we artists have to protect ourselves. Critics can say something, and I as a art critic could say something about somebody's work, and the artist can always say that I'm full of shit. And they have the right to do that, and I respect that. And, um, but at the same time, I've said it, and it's out there, but it leads people to perhaps have an argument or a discussion that wouldn't happen otherwise. At the same time, I was very nervous about this panel because it matters to me what the artists I work with think about what I have to say about their work too. There's this relationship between criticism, artistic production, and future artistic production that I think is important and there, there are ways in which we all work together and have conversations through objects. And then we gather in a room and we have more conversations. And then we go and we make other objects and write other words and have more conversations. And this work to shift the discourse, that's a, a phrase that each of you have used in some form, is part of uh, being an artist and uh, being an art historian and an art critic. I wonder if you could each say something about um, your sense of your own intervention and how that um, idea of entering the discourse, shifting the discourse, has changed over the time uh, of your careers. So each of you, though, you look very young to me, have <laughs> long careers. And I know it's shifted, and we talked about that on Saturday. So talk about that. What does it mean when you connect with an audience versus the, the difficulty of trying to fit into a preconceived notion? Um, that's a really good question. And I think, I think that, um, like with both myself and post-commodity and all the individual practices of the individual members of post-commodity, I think it's something we all share in common. And I don't know if it's to shift the discourse um, in any one particular area. Like, I don't think, like, we don't focus on just land rights or, and do, uh, you know, have our um, uh, careers focus on that. But so I think rather than shifting discourse, we like to complicate it and um, complicate it as much as possible because a lot of Indian discourses and a lot of subjected people's discourses are relegated to binaries. And um, so we have to get outside of those binaries because they're, they're, it's just, it's not logical. And, I mean, unless you're programming an algorithm, it's logical. But um, not if you're programming a really good algorithm. Then it becomes even more complex than just simple binary logic. So um, I would like to think that we 
complicate things. I think there have been so many great artists that have worked before us, both uh, indigenous and non-indigenous. Uh, there have been so many great scholars and thinkers out there. Um, there's so many great ideas that are, that are already in play in the public sphere. So um, I think if we can latch on to something that relates to a particular project and work in that space for a while and complicate that space um, in terms of um, the indigenous perspectives and non-indigenous perspectives from very different um, points of, of view and, and from different contexts, I think that then we're doing our job well. But it, um, it's, it really, I, I think for us too, um, individually and again as a group, I think it comes down a lot to positionality, issues of positionality. Um, there are so many uh, forces trying to position your work when you're an artist. And this goes for non-Indian and indigenous work alike. Um, so it's, it's um, acknowledging that when you enter your career is very, very important. Um, and working within that framework, I have, uh, understanding that, it, it, it means that you have to exercise self-determination as an artist. Um, you have to be thoughtful of, of the work, uh, your body of work, how it works together uh, as a coherent uh, body of work, and then how you talk about your work, how you position it um, in an institutional setting or um, in an academic setting or in a community setting. But um, I think it's important that artists exercise that self-determination. Um, maybe because it's been like uh, brainwashed into me as an Indian person and everything comes down to like self-determination because we make up 2% of the population and it's a real it's a hard life. But um, I think a lot of it uh, is about providing the field with guideposts, with a handle. And I don't want to limit anyone's interpretation or read on a work, but if I can provide a handle that'll maybe push them away from binary logic or push them away from a stereotype or push them away from um, some type of chauvinism that it might be brought to the table or a chauvinism that they may be trying to remove from the table. Um, you know, I think that's where positioning your work is very, very important. Thank you. Brian? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think the, um, the major change in the work that's happening today is that we're not asking for per permission anymore. Mm -hmm. We're not asking for permission to tell our own stories or to make the work we want to make. It's, there's no more pandering. There's no more, is this Indian enough? Is this, is this Indian enough for you? Because honestly, we don't care. And we're changing the market through the work that we're making each and every day, collectively, not only in Santa Fe, but in cities across North America and Canada. So we're all having the same conversation in our own way with different uh, vocabularies, but um, I think it's our responsibility as artists to make it a little bit easier for the next generation of artists to not have to deal with the same issues that we have because it's not always been the case. I mean, there's this sort of um, partnership, unspoken and spoken between contemporary native artists today that you know we're all working towards the same thing. And yeah, there's competitiveness um, as there is with anything, but we, we're all sort of focused on the same um, objectives, which is telling our own story, um, not having to bow down to the um, pressures of galleries and what people want to hang above their couch. We make what we make and then you know you have to deal with it. And that's the main difference is, is that ownership. There's no permission being given and there's no permission being asked for. One more question before we open it up to you. Um, just to go back to each of you to talk about um, one of the conversations we had on Saturday was about the internet and about collectives and the power of both of those as strategies and tools to advance um, our history. Some of the new journals um, appear only online. They're no longer in print. Artwork sometimes uh, can travel um, in amazing ways through these methods. And collectives provide support uh, to continue on when it, it is sometimes difficult as an individual. So uh, each one of you just talk about how those ideas, those tools have shifted that discourse or helped you in particular. I can go. Well, um, 
I don't do much with the internet. I haven't updated my website since 2010, so it's <laughs> um, horrible. Um, we, but as a collective, we update our <laughs> post-commodity website just about every month. So you can overcome like certain shortfall pitfalls or you know weaknesses of individuals. But the thing about collectives in general is, if you put the right people together, you get something that's greater than the sum of the individual parts. And if you're not achieving that in a collective, you need to put a different collective together. It's uh, and there's nothing wrong with going through a number of collectives to get the right one if that's what you want. But for post commodity, it was really really simple. Um, there's no money to be made in this business um, when you're doing non-object based work. Uh, and there's a very finite number of slots at a very f even more finite number of galleries in the, in the US and London and in Germany where you can sell a repellent, you know, objects from repellent fence or you could sell, you know, installations. Um, those are blue chip artists and I am about as far away from a blue chip artist as you can get. Really, really far away. I, you know, I don't even know where to go when I go to LA. You know, I, it just confuses me. But, um, <laughs> but uh, what collectives do, if you, you know, we formed it because we knew we weren't going to be making money and we knew that we could leverage our skill sets, our resources, our ideas, and our budgets, you know, our project budgets. Uh, and, and it was that pragmatic. It was that simple. That's why we formed Post Commodity because um, instead of four of us competing for independently for a project budget, we could come together and really leverage that budget and leverage our skills. And I think, it, uh, I, I don't know if it works for everyone. Um, a lot of collectives work differently, but we work on every piece of work um, as a group. And all of the, all facets of research and development and production as a group. Um, so that means we're not the most prolific you would think a collective could be far more pro prolific, but I don't think changing discourse, shifting discourse, or altering it, or uh, complexifying discourse, um, um, I don't think you need to be prolific. I think you need just good, strong pieces, and I think that's what we've tried to focus on. I think is on the uh, subject I said before of sort of being supportive of younger artists. Um, I was on the periphery of the Humboldt group. Um, they were in practice in the mid-2000s, uh, like 2005, 2009. And a lot of those cats were still in school at IAI and, you know, they put together their own shows and had their own concerts and I was kind of there. I lent uh, as much support as I could. But um, when I had a solo show here um, called Ladies and Gentlemen, this is the Buffalo show about three years ago. I invited some of those members of the Humble to be in my, sh in, in my show as collaborators. So um, I think four of them took me up on it and um, I thought that was really important to give them, you know, because saying you're supportive of other artists is one thing, but to sort of include them in, in your exhibition space is another thing and I, you know, I think that's really important and I'm, you know, I'm glad they decided to take me up on it because um, you know, they're, they're starting to gain um, momentum and notoriety since their graduation. Some of them were still in school when, when the show happened. So um, that's not necessarily anything that would have happened 20 years ago. Certainly not when I was coming out of school. I mean, it was, you know, just very sort of um, exclusionary as far as the hierarchy of um, art in general and native art specifically in this town. So. Um, Collectives with a DIY attitude, um, you know, it's, it's invigorating. It's, it's good to see that, you know, if you're not well received by um, a gallery community, then you don't necessarily need that to start out with. You can have your own um, events and happenings and generate your own buzz, and that's kind of how, you know, a lot of people have started. And um, I'm, I was really, was really glad to see that. And, and um, it was something that I wish was happening when I was going to school at the I. Um, so, collectives do serve a purpose, and um, like he said, you know, it, they're stronger as a collective than, than one person by themselves. And um, you know, I think if you're involved in a collective, you you know, you should be thankful. And sometimes they run their course and, and become something else, and other times they continue for years. So, um, yeah. 
Laura, you started with the first word. You want to end with the last word here? <laughs> Let, let's all uh, gather together and start collectives <laughs> after the <laughs> conclusion of the talk here. <laughs> um, I think that there, there are, there's definitely a great sense of community amongst Native artists and, uh, and um, attached and associated communities and uh, college and university um, art galleries and museums are a lot of times big supporters of, of risky work by Native artists and um, work in non-traditional media like video installation. Um, and there are large projects um, large collaborative projects, like Walking With Our Sisters. Um, Will Wilson is here in the audience, and he has a large um, portrait series involving collaborations with the sitters of the portraits. Um, Rosalie Favel, uh, Matika Wilbur, um, the, uh, there are a large number of very large group and collaborative projects going on at this moment. I think a lot of that is possible because of social media that because it's easier to connect and build other structures, more infrastructure, new communities, um, to create interactions that probably weren't possible 10 years ago to the scale that they are now. And things take off in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thank you. Questions, Thank you, Ryan. Comments, oh, I can't see it with me. Yeah. I think um, when we met on Saturday, the um, major concern about the discussion would be that it wouldn't disintegrate into a complaining symposium. <laughs> and so I think we were constant, consciously trying to avoid some of those things, but the actual discourse is sort of the demand of money. I mean, it is the issue with most artists. It's, it's money versus um, making what you want to make or repeating the same work that you know is popular that will make money because you know, you've sort of been conditioned by the bell to make this kind of work over and over again, or do you go beyond that just to make sort of, um, to build on the work that you're making? So I think the, uh, the issue as an artist and as a native artist, especially in this town, is what is the measure of success? Is it, you know, $80,000 a year in sales, or is it being able to make the paintings you want to make and keep your lights on and feed your family? Um, or is it none of that? Is it just being able to control your own career and um, participate in these events and, and have your voice heard? Um, I know for me that my measure of success, because you know it's definitely not monetary, um, is the respect of my peers. You know my work is um, collected by museums. It's in the uh, Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. It's in this collection and a few others across the country. But I've always been conscious of what I put out in the world, and not a lot of what goes on here in Santa Fe is responsible image making. It's image making for commerce and decoration. So that's my major discourse, is like, you know, I don't make stuff to decorate your home. I make stuff to affect my daughter's life. Man, that's a really good line. I'm going to have to watch that on tape. <laughs> that's a good one, man. Um, like for um, discourses, for instance, with the border piece, with the repellent fence, um, being a policy analyst working in, for a firm who was engaged indirectly and directly in the um, Fast and Furious project, uh, giving w weapons to Mexican cartels so they can track the cartels more effectively. And then you found um, the group of people who were murdered by those weapons and left in the desert for the FBI and, and Border Patrol and things like that. Um, you know, that, there's a, that's kind of the backdrop uh, you know, I had access to a lot of people, um, a, a lot of people at the federal government and the bureaus, a lot of attorneys. So there's a legal dis discourse around the borderlands 
um, that I've been doing content analysis of for the past, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, also, the discourses from the Goldwater Institute in particular, um, they were responsible for helping shape uh, and muster through bills through the, the state legislature legislature through the House and Senate uh, within Arizona for, as, for the anti-immigration uh, bills and anti-ethnic studies bills. Coldwater Institute played a really important role in that. So um, I'd, I've done analysis of their reports um, and anywhere in their report you never see any tribal identification or any acknowledgement of indigeneity. Um, the Morrison Institute, home at Arizona State University, another place where we are trying to uh, affect discourse, uh, doing a content analysis of all of their reports related to uh, going back all the way to pre-NAFTA days to now, no use of the word uh, indigenous. So um, those are two major research institutions that impact uh, policy in the Southwest. Uh, that we're very concerned about, but also the state legislator. You know, I'm really fortunate. My wife's father worked there for 26 years as state representative for Navajo Nation. So I have access to the state legislator, legislature and people working there that my firm doesn't have access to. So I've analyzed the entire public record uh, of debates on the floor about the uh, anti-immigration and anti-ethnic studies bills. Again, not once was American Indian or indigenous ever used, even when talking specifically about Tohono O'odham people. So um, also the Urban Institute, they have produced a number of landmark reports providing important analysis for US Congress on immigration issues. Nowhere in their reports will you find the word indigenous. And then finally, the Center for Community Change, the largest community organizing network in the United States that has a very large footprint in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. Nowhere in their outreach materials, their research, or their uh, analyses documents will you find the word indigenous. So those are some specific examples just of, from that one work that we're trying to address and reference. And we'll be doing lots of public programming to address that specifically. We'll be publishing a book and we're working with authors in Mexico and in the United States, indigenous people and non-indigenous people, to uh, try to shift that discourse in a more structured way. So I think we have time for one more question. Or comment. Well, thank you very much for being a great audience. And